Okay, welcome to HJC's public meeting for additional air quality analysis for transportation conformity. Um, we'll get started with a presentation uh, from Graciela Lubertina and then get into some questions and uh, potentially answers. And if anybody has any written or oral comments they'd like to deliver, we'll accept them at that point. Thanks. Hey, well, thank you for coming here. Um, today I'm going to tell you why we are doing this additional air quality analysis due to recent uh, events that uh, this uh, additional air quality analysis we call as a new one. Okay, uh, you may remember that uh, we started the conformity, the air quality conformity to the 2014 regional transportation plan last year. And then we went for public comment in December and January. When we were in public comment, there was a court decision, a federal court decision, uh, in December 23rd, actually, that uh, they said that EPA exceeded its authority, its authority uh, when, when it was adopting the eight hour, uh, 2008 8-hour ozone standard because they revoked the 1997 8-hour ozone standard only for transportation conformity and also they changed the schedules of the attendant demonstration and that was inconsistent with the DNR Act. So next step please. Due to this court decision, then we needed to include the year, the networks for the year 2017 and 2018, specifically 2018 is the uh, attainment year for the 1997 8-hour ozone standard. So, uh, so we need now to calculate uh, using the networks. We couldn't uh, do interpolation anymore for these uh, years. And in addition, we also included the Proposition 1 uh, projects into this year and, uh, and it's consistent with uh, the conformity that already went uh, for approval uh, to TPC in January. Next slide. So these are the results in yellow are the results for the, um, for the calculations that we had to do for 2017 and 2018. We couldn't use the interpolation anymore, and uh, it still shows that this, uh, the emissions coming from the years are below the budget. So it still shows conformity to the emission budget that we have for, from the 1997 and 2000. Okay, so in the next slide, okay. Uh, all this is going to go for approval uh, to our consultation partners, that are is uh, EPA, TechSoft, ECQ, and Federal Highway. And um, if they approve this uh, before April, then they, they will approve it with the results that we just uh, amended. Now, if uh, they approve it after April, then uh, we may not need this, uh, this additional results anymore because EPA, last Friday, EPA totally revoked the 1997 eight hour ozone standard and then uh, it's going to be effective in April. So I hope this is clear. <laughs> <laughs> Just ask me any questions if you want. In next slide, we got the uh, how to get into the conformity documentation. You can just go to the HCAC.com, our website, and search for the transportation conformity and uh, go from there into the 2040 uh, conformity to the conformity to the 2040 RPG. Or just use the, the websites, the short links. And this new public comment is for two weeks from February 13th to February 26th. Thank you. Any questions? I don't know if it was clear the fact that uh, the fact that these results are not going to be could not be needed. <laughs> well, 
we're joined today. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for those of you that, uh, sure. for those of you that may be uh, joining us uh, on uh, watching a recording of this webinar on our website, we have one person from the public joining us this evening, uh, Brant Manchin, uh, and I think he has some prepared comments and that might generate some discussion. So, uh, Brant, uh, go ahead. Yeah, oh, one question. If, if we uh, if we approve. Before, uh, before, before May and April, just at the end of April, yes. then we will not need this uh, additional money. Yeah, because uh, the fact that EPA does revoke the, the, the 1997 uh, eight hour ozone standard and it's going to be effective in April, April, middle of April more or less, so then that uh, that means that then we don't need to conform. We, we don't need to have the levels for those two years. So then if we don't need the level for those two years, we can go back to the interpolation. To the interpolation calculation yeah. that it was in the original conformity. We, we need them, but we, we could show, what, uh, we could show uh, that we conform to those years using interpolation. So we don't need to do, time, right? we don't need yes. to do the whole calculation, right. Right. network, and BFD, and emission factors, and all that. Right, because 2018 is an attainment year yeah. under the 97 standard, we would have to, if that rule, if, if that standard is in effect, when uh, conformity finding would be issued, we would have to use direct analysis for that year <coughs> to demonstrate conformity. If the 97 standard is fully revoked, um, then it's just uh, it's just a budget test, uh, which we could satisfy with the existing documentation that has already been prepared. Yeah. So we're we're putting this forward as the additional analysis that is available if it is necessary to complete uh, a finding of, of conformity from our federal partners. But uh, it doesn't substantially uh, doesn't in fact doesn't change really the plan at all. Uh, we did mention the one project. Uh, that is shown in a different fiscal year than the, uh, the earlier documentation, but that change, if we can use interpolation, is consistent with the existing plan. So it's only because we're adding 2017 and 18 that we would need to make that adjustment to the document. Yeah, so, yeah. All right. Yeah. Brant. Yeah. Green is go. Green's good. Maybe his. Is it working? Thanks. All right. Thank you. My name is Brad Hanson. I think what I see all the saying was that this is an insurance policy. Kind of. <laughs> if things don't go right and you need to have this analysis, you've got the analysis. Um, I've got a couple of comments I want to make, and also I'm going to add in some comments. Um, Notice that Appendix 15, the public comment process, um, I was surprised that Air Alliance Houston, who made some comments, apparently got a letter responding to those comments, and the Sierra Club did not. I don't know why that happened. But we asked it to you. I have received nothing. I received no letter that, uh, until a couple days ago when I went to look at all the appendices, I didn't even know there was a response to our comment. Mm -hmm. So I, I, the Sierra Club has received nothing, and we would like, just yeah. like airlines, to get a response to comment. So I want to make it. say for the future, we would like to have that happen. Uh, appendix 12, which deals with uh, transportation control measures and their timely implementation, this control measures that go all the way back approximately 15 years. But what's not there and what would be helpful to the public, I think, is um, any sort of monitoring effort that is looking at not just are these constructed, but are they having the effects that they're supposed to have, which is to use. Multiple organic and nitrogen oxide emissions. 
there doesn't seem to be short-term or long-term effectiveness monitoring. And if there is, it's not labeled that way. And this is particularly important to the public for two reasons. One, the public, it, their health is affected. So any sort of control measures that are done, obviously it's the public's benefit to know what those are and that they are affected. Uh, the second thing is um, the public pays for the TCMs as well as the whole transportation system. So telling the public that these are improving your health and something that the public ought to be able to look at data and say, by golly, and so So, <clears throat> would like to encourage HGC uh, effectiveness monitoring is not being done for TCM, that in the future we take a look at that because that would be very helpful for the public to be able to look at that and say, my God, it's really working. Especially whatever was done in 2000, 15 years ago, is it still as effective as today? Um, if in fact there's degradation of those emission reductions, then we should find that out. And then we should start saying to ourselves, okay, what are we going to do? Because we're assuming those TCMs are still reducing emissions in 2000 the same as they would be today. We don't, I'm not sure we know the answer. Um, appendix 10, the post-process uh, Texas LED adjustment. The concern that the club has there is it, it appears a lot of these adjustments are, are made on some sort of assumptions that are not provided, not explained to the public. It would be helpful to have that where a certain percentage reduction is plugged in and says, okay, every year it's going to be 4.87% or whatever. So, um, but there's a lot of reasons why these assumptions might not occur. Everything from insufficient enforcement personnel training on time uh, to increased numbers of vehicles and miles travel data collection that's not coming. There's lots of reasons why these things may not happen. And now the they that they get led is the Texas low emission diesel is the, the only diesel that is available in Texas and it's lower in sulfur than in the rest of the country. And because it's lower in sulfur produces less NOx. So that those are the emission reductions coming from using a, a cleaner fuel. Well, that would be helpful if the public is told what the assumptions are. Okay, I, I, maybe I should explain more. Yeah. yeah. But it's uh, the only diesel that is available in Texas. The other diesel is not. So, it's even uh, the Tesla is even used, you know, for boats uh, now and, you know, in, in the ship channel. So. And again, this ties in with what I said previously, which is some way to be able to Okay. Verify okay. that reductions we assume mm -hmm. are in fact still occurring, mm -hmm. but did occur in the first place. Regarding the agenda, um, concern that we have had for probably 10 or more years, and we still have. Everyone at EPA's models that you were generating you know, your budgets and your estimating your emissions and comparing those and all that. Every model EPA has had has been found to be underestimating, uh, underestimating emissions. And EPA has had to come back many times and say, whoops, you know, we found some more emissions, we need to tweak the model and it would be helpful if the every model has a, a percent error. It's only accurate to a certain percent plus. 
It would be helpful to know what that is for the model. Um, for instance, in 2008, the NOx emissions are estimated to be 97.19 tons per day. The NOx budget is 103.34 tons per day, a difference of 6.15 tons per day. Well, if we have, for instance, a lot of models are 10 to 20 percent long, you know, plus or minus. If that is the case and it's minus, we could have 10 to 20 tons per day versus 6.5, 1.5 tons per day. So we could be missing not actually meeting what the model says. So it would be really helpful to know when the model runs are done, are we overestimating or underestimating, and so how many times. Um, because those percent errors are really important. Um, and so I'd like to encourage HGHD to include that information. Um, also, we know that the I will call it a model vehicle drive trip that EPA puts together to go into the model that generates what an average vehicle will generate in NOx and VOC emissions, you know, this drive time trip. Um, we know that EPA has found repeatedly that its model trip is an average people drive differently and therefore oftentimes create more air pollution than what that trip general, uh, says the average person generates. So, so it's a concern in how accurate they are and what we do. Um, in table 10, dealing with centerline miles, Something didn't make, doesn't make sense. According to that table, between 2018 and 2040, we'll, we'll have an increase of 158 center line miles, which is about seven miles per year. And between 2035 and 2040, center line lane miles will only increase one mile. Considering, and obviously we're projecting into the future, but considering what we're doing today with the legislature, creating more money to build more roads, and also that we are, in essence, the population development growth that's expected, planned for, and will be built for suggests we will have more center line miles and fewer. And so, we're kind of concerned whether those center line miles that, that those figures are accurate. Um, when you look at how the stars are aligning for getting more money to construct more tollways, more freeways, more. Um, table 14, pages 6 and 7. It looks at 2017 and 2019. It's confusing. The end model year for 2017 used is 1995 and 2015. But for 2018, in other words, the very next year, the end model year used is 2013. That doesn't seem to make sense. Maybe it does, but when you just look at the figures, it doesn't seem to make sense. So, uh, maybe a, an explanation about that would be helpful. And finally, uh, we just want to go on record once again as opposing the Grand Parkway and all the projects. I think there must be about two pages worth of time. Um, due to the landscape, land use, and natural ecosystem impacts. 
And we also have problems with the four bend tollway road from Siena Parkway to uh, the Grand Parkway. It's about a 9.25 mile stretch. Um, and it will be a toll road and we'll have a bridge over the Brazos River. Um, which we think the $241 million is the lowest. It's going to cost a whole lot more than that. And also, important habitats like Columbia Bottomlands, Harbor, Bloodplain, and Forestry Weapons will be impacted by that. And that will bring uh, additional access for growth in that area. And so we perceive that that's also not a project that we would like to see. Again, thank you very much, Brant, for your comments. Uh, uh, I think we can provide a little bit of feedback now. Uh, first of all, uh, please be assured you will be receiving a full response to your previous comments on the 2040 RTP. I know they are developing that. It may be that it has not yet been transmitted, but we can find that out for you. What's well, in the appendix, so, but it was never your, sent Your letter, apparently. yeah. Your letter is there. A response is not, is that what you're saying? The response is there. Oh, the response is there. But it was never sent to us. Okay. Uh, okay. There's no date on it. There's no signature. There is a name on the right. bottom. Okay. But the Airlines Houston document had a date on top and a signature on the bottom, which means to me that it was sent. Right. Yeah, no, I think there's a, a I think they're preparing a more formal response to their complete comments, if I had to guess. It but we can follow up. Does. It yes. shocked me to, to see it there and not yeah. have received it. Understood. And we can follow up with you on that. Um, I'd also say uh, kind of um, your additional comments today that will get you a more fulsome response than what you're going to get today. Uh, but just kind of recollecting back to where we began, um, can you refresh our memory of which uh, hit the topics and we can go one by one through them? Since the only one here. We'll just walk through your comments. Well, the first, that was the first one. Right. The second one we talked about, I talked about TCM. Uh, TCMs, okay. Some sort of monitoring right. to ensure yep. that they're still right. reducing emissions as they should. Understood. Um, again, part of the issue here is that the process that you're commenting on, the conformity process, our requirement is that we document the completion of those projects that were identified as commitments. That's what that document is intended to do. That's what that document does. I understand your comment. It is not uh, you know, something that you don't find a support here necessarily for, but the document is performing its intended no, purpose. I fully so, understand. Yeah. You don't have to give me those right. kinds of comments. Yeah. I fully, I've been yeah. involved in this since 1991 or 92. Right. Yeah. So I, I fully understand what you have to do right. and maybe what it would be good to do. Right. We understand the comments. Uh, I'd also say there are other avenues through which similar data is collected, uh, both uh, some locally but mostly nationally. The CMAC program does collect some of that information on a nationwide basis to look at the cost effectiveness of similar projects. Uh, of course, we're always challenged by the ability to estimate future uh, reductions from a project. The activity levels uh, in a particular area, as you're pointing out, can be different than uh, and when the project is implemented from when it was originally conceived, and there can be some differences there. Um, your next comment pertained to? Um, it just had to do with uh, under the uh, post-process. The post-process, the, the text led. The text led. It's about the assumptions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I can explain. I can explain. Yeah. I mean, well, again, I think it's it's what I said, it's because the petrol for level is even less than the clean diesel that is uh, selling the rest of the country. Okay. And those are the type and of comments we're looking at on the, on the 2006. Right. And the next... Uh, had to do with uh, whether the model... Uh, the yes, the error, the, the error, amount of error. error positive or negative, right. because depending on that, you could actually be within the window of the percent right. error, but show that you're actually emitting more than the budget. And the reverse is also true, correct? True. I, I said uh, close in mind. And, and, yeah, and that's part of the challenge with conformity is that we have a budget that is expressed as a single number. Right. And is it expecting an estimate that is also expressed as a single number? Um, uncertainty 
and error are not expressly included anywhere in that SIP process that I can tell yeah. uh, in the development because of those the, budgets. The, the uncertainty so. in the model right. is taken into account in the photochemical model, but not in, in, in the inventories. The inventories, I mean, the inventories have errors, could, could be some errors, you know, errors in the estimation of EMP, errors in the vision factors, but that is not uh, taken into consideration because those numbers are the numbers, are the best numbers that we could have so far. That's why, I mean, all these models have been updated all the time, because we knew the data, you know, they have uh, better numbers, I mean, better emission factors, but the the reason why is so the error is shown in, in the photochemical model and you can calculate it there is because you have monitors that realize, you know, they measure concentration and then the photochemical model also outputs concentration. So then you can compare the concentration of ozone given in the in the mission model, in the no, no sorry, in the photochemical model versus uh, how much ozone is in reality for the same day. So then you can compare it and then you say, oh, okay, see, if the monitor is saying 80 ppb, but the model is saying uh, 70, you can calculate the error. But uh, in our case, we don't have any reality check. We don't have a reality check. We only have the emission factors coming from a model, the BMP coming from another model, and then we put the, all this together. Well, the BMP is validated with traffic counts. The yeah. Well, I mean, this is part of the emission stream that we're looking at, not the entirety of, and, and, right? So what we can observe is everything. The share of yeah. other stands that you're using the model, because that's the model the EPA gives you. Mm -hmm. But it would be a whole lot more elucidating, honest, if we could see kind of are we consistently plus on the side or minus on the side, because this is kind of one of those gross error kind of things where I don't think the model is actually designed to be as accurate as it, it needs to be to really show that budget the way it should, but that's the way it is. Well, it, it, and, and we understand that. So we, we wanted to, again, bring, bring forth that that is a concern. At, at least, at least the, the way that the conformity is done is the same way as the mission inventories that went into the photochemical model are done, exactly in the same way. So then, you know, you can, you can see, you know, well, the checking. I mean, we've we had the same problem with the model mobile sex and yeah. the SIP. Right. At the same moment. Same they, problem. Yeah. You, know, you never see, are we going, we're always positive or always negative or, you know, and we, we're, we're trying to get a really precise number, but can the model really give you that precise number given the percent error? The, well, the model cannot give you the precise number, but if you go into the SIP and then you see the, the base here, uh, that was model. The model is uh, the way it works. It can first it, they do a base year that they compare versus reality, right. and then there they calculate the error. And it has at least uh, the maximum error, depending on the base, is uh, maximum 25 percent. 25. 25. 25. 25. Plus <laughs> I, I know for a, yeah. for for modelers that may be kind of normal. It's kind of normal, actually. But nonetheless, <laughs> when, you're, when you're looking at a budget that's sort of like 123.6, but you're saying that you could be a minus 25% off, makes it feel a little... No, I, I think we understand your comments. Sure. Um, and we just wanted to bring that. We out will again. bring it, you know, forward our comments received to the, the entities that might be able to actually more fully respond to them. <laughs> uh, you know, as you mentioned, we're handed uh, and required to use certain, um, you know, modeling platforms, and totally. what you're talking about is really, unfortunately, probably EPA and TCQ more than yes. our particular yeah. process here. The, the but yeah, I understand. That we submit. 
this. Does EPA see those? Things? They do. That's another reason. They do. For yeah. us no, absolutely. Yeah. I totally understand. Yep. Yeah. Totally EPA understand. So EPA understands that someone is still concerned about right. making that model a better model. And I would assume that these comments have been previously submitted to EPA on their rulemakings related to. Let's hope so. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and then you. I mentioned the center line miles. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is uh, essentially an artifact of uh, the 2040 RTP in large part has the same or very similar projects in it that our most recent 2035 RTP had in it with very few exceptions. Most of the projects are pretty much the same. We have some updates from local governments on thoroughfares and things like that. But we're talking about major significant projects. It's essentially kind of the same project mix. So what you're seeing there is very few projects getting pushed beyond 2035 to 2040. So you're not seeing yet a whole lot of, in fact, we did not demonstrate a lot of fiscal capacity to have more projects in that later time period. So as future plan updates come forward, you will see more changes there and more lane miles uh, showing up in the 2040 versus 2035. So that's just a, an easy observation of why you're seeing that right now right. is that most of the projects still say 2035 on them, not 2040. I did want to mention yeah. that it, it didn't quite make sense. Right. Yeah. I, no, I totally don't disagree with you in that uh, our, our local governments are going to continue to invest in thoroughfare development and other things, right? Uh, how much uh, right now? I don't know that any of us could say exactly. 2035 is still a good ways away. Uh, and maybe we'll have a, a significant change in our transportation investment policies. Who knows? Uh, but your, your point is well taken that... Uh, I, I will be dead yeah. by then. Well, I hope not. You won't have me to I hope not. Ask I, I, I was going to say that the one mile is probably just a rounding error. And I'll get in and kind of see how we calculated it. I guess seven lane miles for 2035 and 2040 should be the same. Well, we should have some projects that mm -hmm. moved. Well, you get these center line miles, right? Well, what, yeah. I, what I did was yeah. I took the 22 years yeah. and I divided them into 158 mm -hmm. miles between 2018-2040. Right. Right. That gives you about 7.1 per year. Right. But that, but there was a specific on that table, mm -hmm. 2035 and 2040, and there was only one right. lane mile difference. And again, I, I would Instead attribute that to we probably line. moved a, a widening projects more right. than we moved a yeah. new new alignment projects. So, so that we see more lane well, yeah. miles than... Anyway, I just so, wanted to point yeah. that out because it, it looked kind of... Right. This is, this is new information presented in this for me. Actually, center line miles versus lane miles is confusing for most people. So it's one lane, center line mile and 12 lane miles. What does that mean? It's hard. I, I, Maybe you could explain that also in, that probably. in the documents. Yeah. So, that, Actually, you know... People like, like me who aren't that up to date could understand that that would be helpful. That would be helpful. And then the last thing was uh, table 14. Oh, yeah. The end model years. Yeah, and I, that, that may be something. Those, those are the, that's the inspection and maintenance uh, programs. And different programs are valid to different. Uh, type of uh, years, like the one that starts in the 1990 and finishes in 1995, another one that starts in... Uh, well, when I was 2038, it did make... Yes, and, and more than yes. You know, anyway, I'm sure y'all will respond and tell oh, yeah. me what that is. It just looked, again, yeah. kind of... <laughs> no, thank you, you very know, much for taking I was trying to compare yeah. things, you know, and I was like, oh, it's really different. So. Very good. Um, just for the record, I don't think we went around the room to indicate who is here today. We have Charles Arihudian from Texas Houston District, Nicholas Williams from HJC, uh, Chris Van Slyke from HJC, Gracia Lubertino from HJC gave our presentation. My name is David Wardlow with HJC. We have Marco Bracamontes with HJC, Stephen Gage from HJC, uh, Jim Dickinson from HJC, 
and Michael Onoga from HGAC as well, in addition to Brent Manchin, our member of the public who has joined us uh, for this meeting. Thank you for coming. All right. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Brent. Um, and I'll go ahead and close the recording. We will stay here. It is now 620. 620. We'll be here another 10 minutes until uh, the, the full period of the uh, meeting elapses. Thank you very much.